Good happy Saturday morning. It is Saturday, August 20th, 2021. I'm Riley King. Welcome to the Saturday morning edition of the Riley King Newscast, right here on the Riley King Network. We have a lot of news to get to this Saturday morning, so let's get started right now. First up, Man sentenced to life in prison for killing New Hampshire journalist James Foley. Three others. Let's take a listen to that video from WMUR News 9. What does it take to be the best? It takes guts, grit. Al Shafi Al Sheikh sentenced to life in prison Friday in federal court in Alexandria, Virginia, for his role in the kidnapping and deaths of four Americans by Islamic State, including New Hampshire journalist James Foley and Kimball Union Academy graduate Stephen Sotloff. Too often when there's violence to our U.S. nationals in the world, there's no accountability. So this is a momentous day. James Foley's mother, Diane, says the verdict brings some justice. Let this sentencing make clear to all who dare to kidnap, torture, or kill any American citizen abroad that U.S. justice will find you wherever you are and that our government will hold you accountable for your crimes against our citizens. Diane Foley says more than 67 Americans are currently being detained abroad. So I urgently call on our President Biden to employ our shrewdest negotiation to quickly bring these innocent Americans home, lest they die in captivity as our sons and daughters did. Still, she says there has been progress, including a presidential executive order declaring this a national emergency and an extraordinary threat to our national security. El Sheikh's Eight life sentences are to be served concurrently. There is no parole in the federal system. He plans to appeal his lawyer, saying his confessions should have been ruled inadmissible because of the alleged mistreatment while in custody. Reporting live, Grace Feinerman, WMUR News 9. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Albany car crash leaves one person dead. One person died after a car crash Friday night in Albany. New Hampshire State Police said they are investigating a crash on Route 16. Police have not publicly identified the deceased or anyone else involved in the accident. A detour has been on Route 16 since around 5.30 p.m., authorities said. Adam Montgomery's attorneys file motion to surpass evidence from a cell phone. Let's take a listen to that video from WMUR News 9. If you have ever dreamed of having granite or quartz countertops in your kitchen, but thought it was too expensive, Bob's Granite Plays... After nearly eight and a half months, Adam Montgomery's lawyers want a judge to throw out evidence of a cell phone that authorities found in his possession. It would be very surprising, quite frankly, if you did not see any motions filed um, by a defense attorney. We asked former county attorney Patricia LaFrance of the Black Law Group about the defense's argument that police did not have a warrant when they seized the phone and didn't until a month later. That's their job. They have to make sure that the police have um, abided by the Constitution and afforded that person their constitutional rights as guaranteed uh, through the Bill of Rights in our Constitution. According to the defense motion, one officer said that another officer would hold it, quote, for a second, just until detectives get here. Did they have 
um, the right to first seize the cell phone and then later search it pursuant to a warrant. The motion says police kept the phone, but a search warrant was not prepared and approved until January 31st. The police are entitled to do that. Um, when they go into a subject's home or a car, they may not you know, they may not know what they're going to find. And then when they do see something that could potentially have evidentiary value, then they are allowed to seize it to a certain extent. Patricia LaFrance said that it's going to be interesting because New Hampshire law regarding cell phones is a little more protective than federal law. And she also says that there will most likely be a hearing with the officers involved and that they will have to testify. Here in Manchester, Troy Lynch, WMUR News Now. Okay, there you go on that video and that report. Only minor injuries when house explodes in Hampstead. Let's take a listen to that video from WMUR News 9. Are aches and pains catching up to you? You can relax. Mainly Tubbs Self-Care Summer Sales Event is here. Our wellness products can relieve stress and anxiety, boost your immune system, and promote overall well-being. Now is a great time to invest in yourself with huge savings on hundreds of in-stock hot tubs, free saltwater system upgrades, and special 60-month financing. The self I feel like I'm blessed, though, that we didn't get hurt, so I believe the Lord had his hand on us. Nathan Close was asleep inside his school street home in Hampstead when it blew up around 7 o'clock Friday morning. I heard the explosion, and then stuff was starting to fall on me, and I woke up and said, what is going on? My son told was yelling, Dad, get out, Dad, get out. So I got out, grabbed a pair of pants, and got out. The house was leveled. The blast so intense it scattered debris across the property and into the road. Neighbors were rocked by the unexpected wake-up call. You could feel the whole house shake. It was it was like something I've never actually felt before. I thought it was a plane that crashed or something. It just shook the whole house. Emergency crews arrived to smoke and flames coming from the collapsed house. Close and his son were helped out of their home by firefighters walking away with just minor injuries. Very remarkable that there wasn't some more serious injuries today given the amount of damage to this house. As the day continued, crews combed through what remains of the house trying to figure out just how this happened. Right now we're just in looking at each of those appliances and trying to determine if there's any uh, damage around those. And uh, so we're, just, we're narrowing down the appliances at this point to try to figure out what might have happened. And now, Close's son was cooking at the time of this explosion, which is why investigators are focusing in on those appliances. Right now, officials believe propane is to blame. Reporting live in Hampstead, I'm Tim Callery, WMUR News 9. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Construction debris thrown onto I-293 and damages vehicles, police say. Let's take a listen to that video from WMUR News 9. If you have ever dreamed of having granite or quartz countertops in your kitchen, but thought it was too expensive, Bob's Granite Place can make your dream a reality. Granite countertops start at only $29.99. Around 10 10 Thursday night, the unexpected happened during a drive down 293 in Manchester. I heard what sounded like a loud thud. It sounded like it hit behind me. This is Josh Leike's dash cam footage. On his drive home from work, you could see two objects being thrown off the Queen City Bridge onto the interstate. It wasn't for just the speed I was traveling, the angle was thrown. It looked like it was pretty much aimed right at my windshield. For Josh, the right side of his car was scraped and scratched, but he didn't know exactly what happened until he reviewed the footage. Footage. Once I realized there was somebody had thrown something, I was angry. I was quite furious. Like, if that had hit my windshield, I probably could have died. The objects that were reportedly thrown, shovels, concrete, and four-foot lengths of rebar that hit three other cars. State officials say that none of the drivers were injured. Definitely could have been a lot worse. The debris flying through the air, potentially sharp art objects. Um, could have been a potential for some serious injury. Smash windshields and additional other damage. State police are saying that this is a rare occurrence. We're actively investigating the incident, and you know, we're going to try to track down exactly what happened and hold people accountable. 
Now, state police are also asking if there was anybody driving through the Queen State Bridge or at least going on top of it. Last night from around 10 to 10, 15 p.m., to please come to them and contact them if you have any additional information. Live here in Manchester, Troy Lynch, WMUR News 9. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Unprecedented 30-day shutdown of MBTA's Orange Line begins. Let's take a listen to that video from WCVB Boston. At Honeypot Hill, it's a fun-filled day for the whole family. Pick your own apples and pears, enjoy delicious apple cider donuts, or hop on a hayride with cute animals, challenging mazes, and so much more. Your adventure begins at honeypothill.com. It's going to be crazy. Gates and zip ties blocking the entrance to Back Bay Station. And shuttle buses replacing trains on Dartmouth Street. As the MBTA begins their unprecedented 30-day shutdown of the Orange Line. Over the next month, the T says they'll be making five years worth of repairs. In the meantime, 180 shuttle buses will be replacing the line, many of them making practice runs in the hours ahead of the shutdown. There will be a number of new dedicated bus lanes and bus turning lanes along the diversion route, and these special routes, these special lanes are delineated. Residents and T-Riders say the added street congestion will make the city unbearable. I think a lot of people will probably resort to taking their cars as well as, you know, bikes and buses and whatnot. So it's going to increase the traffic. T officials are asking for the public's patience as they roll out alternatives for riders. Many people will be impacted, even if they aren't using the MBTA. We get this. A group of elected officials rode a shuttle bus on the route north of Government Center to Oak Grove. The entire trip took about 40 minutes, but that was without traffic. I think the traffic's going to be a problem. We do have more bus lanes that are temporary painted, but it, it's less than perfect. I'll be very honest with you. And the T says they will be fluid throughout this closure and make adjustments as needed. We're live outside of Back Bay Station. Danae Bucci, WCVB, New Center 5. Danae, thank you. Our Nathalie Pozo is live in Jamaica Plain. Nathalie, it's a whole new world for commuters. It really is, Maria, and take a look here. The gates are up by where riders would normally swipe in order to get onto the train. The doors here are locked as well, and the signs for the shuttle buses are up. Now riders having to navigate all of this for the next 30 days. The orange line officially shut down. The sign that would normally tell how far away the trains are, now just showing the time. It's yeah. inconvenient. We hope they can improve. Shuttle buses now dropping and picking up passengers. Signs went up at the Jackson Square stop in Jamaica Plain directing riders. If they provide the shuttle bus, they should have provided the whole line. If they cancel the whole line, instead of we depart from the from Forest Hill, come here. Crews working non-stop up until the last minute ahead of the 30-day shutdown. It's really starting to hit me that, wow, this is it. On the orange line, riders heading home during their last evening commute. I'm going to end up taking the commuter rail in. Um, normally I bike in to Oak Grove and then take the orange line all the way into State Street. Others still putting plans in place. They're going to have a commuter rail from Forest Hill, so I'm hoping that that will work. We'll see, you know, how many people are using it or what that's going to look like, but that's what I'm thinking, or Uber in some days as well, too. Lots of uncertainty, but riders say they hope the MBTA can do what they need to do in 30 days. I hope it works at the end of the 30 days. And back out here live, you can see one of those shuttle buses just pulling up here to the Jackson Square Station. So, you know, a lot of people still figuring out what their options are. Boston Mayor Michelle Wu says that she will be in the thick of this come Monday. She says she's actually going to try the shuttle buses on Monday and then maybe the commuter rail the next day. Again, everyone just putting different plans in place to see which one sticks. We're live in Jamaica Plain. Nathalie Pozo, WCBB News Center 5. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. And stay with the Riley King Network as we keep you updated on this shutdown.
Cheney says talks are underway for Pence to testify in front of January 6th committee. Let's take a listen to that video from ABC News. Wayfair has everything I need to make my home totally me. Sometimes I'm a homebody, so cozy. Intriguing remark from former Vice President Mike Pence saying he would consider testifying before the January 6th committee if he was asked. Tonight, Representative Liz Cheney, the Republican vice chair of that committee, weighing in on that possibility in an exclusive interview. And will former President Trump be asked to testify as well? Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. Former Vice President Mike Pence says he would consider testifying before the January 6th committee. And today, that committee's vice chair, Liz Cheney, told me talks are already underway on making that happen. He said this week he's willing or willing to consider testifying if he is asked. Are you going to ask him? So we've been in discussions uh, with his counsel when the country has been through something as grave as this was. Uh, everyone who has information has an obligation to step forward. So uh, I would hope that, that he will do that. So you think we'll see him here in September in this room? I would the hope committee. that, well... Uh, I would hope that he, he will understand how important it is uh, for the American people to know uh, every aspect of the truth about what happened that day. No comment tonight from the former vice president. He was right in the middle of it all on January 6th, defying Trump and facing violent threats as a result. <laughs> Those top advisors have testified before the committee. Pence himself has been reluctant to talk about what happened that day, sometimes even downplaying it. But now, as he considers his own run for president, Pence says he is ready to open up about what he went through. The American people have a right to know what happened that day. And in the months and years ahead, I'll be telling my story even more frequently. Then there's the question of Donald Trump. Could he be asked to testify too? Cheney did not close the door. I don't want to make any announcements about that uh, this morning. But it's possible you'd, you'd ask him before wrapping up to testify. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, again, I, I don't want to get in front of uh, committee deliberations about that. I do think it's very important. His interactions with our committee uh, will be under oath. Jonathan Carl joins us now from Washington. And, John, if Republicans take over the Congress in midterms, the work of the January 6th committee will soon come to a grinding halt. Congresswoman Cheney clearly aware the clock is ticking here. She's keenly aware the time is running out and looking to do all that she can do uh, before the end of this Congress. I would look, uh, Lindsay, for uh, at least two more hearings, potentially uh, high-impact, high-profile hearings uh, in the fall, and of course, uh, a final report. Jonathan Carl, our thanks to you. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. That does it for this morning edition of the Riley King Newscast right here on the Riley King Network. Thank you for tuning in and listening. Have a great day, everyone, and goodbye.